Welcome to the Real Estate Reserve Podcast with your hosts, Jason Balin and Ian Horowitz. What's up, what's up, what's up, Ian? What's up, man? How you doing? <clears throat> not too bad, not too bad. Changed up our time a little bit, uh, a little after 9 o'clock on Thursday morning. Uh, we've been trying to get this uh, book review in because Ian and I are pumped because we just read uh, this book by Sam Zell, who we were big followers of, uh, calling Am I Being Too Subtle? And we're going to give you, you know, throughout the show, a um, lot of little tidbits, some, some takeaways that we personally had from the book. And obviously recommend uh, you check out the book if you if you like the Sam Sam Zell. Obviously, we're not pitching or selling his book. We're just going to go through uh, experiences that we personally had. Um, it's a new segment that we're going to start doing with the show as we kind of uh, re- read books and absorb a bunch of content, make sure we, we share it. I've done a lot of these book reviews in the past uh, on our other Hard Money Bankers podcast that we did. And they're a lot of fun because information that I get from this might be different than information that Ian gets, depending on where we are in our lives and our business. And I personally love, 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 love books like this, where the author tells their life story going back. He's in his seventies now. And let me tell you, I, you know, I, I listen to all my books. I don't read them. So I listen to everything. And he's actually the one who's dictating and doing the reading uh, alongside. And let me tell you, that's, that's impressive. That's hard to do. He's in his seventies and he's you know reading the book and he does a great job of it. So you, you hear it in his voice and in his tense. And uh, I don't know if you listen to audiobooks in general, but if you have somebody bad who's dictating those things, it's hard to listen to. And if it's somebody that like comes off to be sleazy salesman or something that doesn't work, but I love it. So it's uh, the, whole, the whole life story of somebody, especially a successful real estate investor like like Sam, is is amazing. So Ian, you want to just do a quick background of like who Sam Zell is, and then we'll kind of dig into some some things. Yeah, no. So I I knew vaguely who Sam Zell Sam Zell was. I know he does commentate on uh, CNBC and a few other shows. They bring him in because he is one of the founder. Well, he's credited to be not the founder of the REITs, but one that helped explode that marketplace. Um, at one point, he was the largest uh, <clears throat> apartment holder, largest office space holder. Um, and there was two other industries that he was in that he was number one in. Um, you know, and he takes his life story all the way back to when his parents were fleeing um, Poland and the adversity that they went through. And you can almost see the immigrant story through the way he tells it, even though he's not technically an immigrant. He might have been conceived during their immigration, but, um, you know, he, you can really tell that he grew up in a family that uh, was was challenged and those challenges forced them to, you know, bounce back on their feet and, you know, take extraordinary measures. And I, I think that gives them a competitive advantage in business. Sometimes I, I think those that, you know, come from an affluent family sometimes can be, um, they don't have that same drive or fire versus somebody that, you know, has to, has to do it, you know, out of need. And I think that's what he saw from his father, you know, um, and you got to remember it, it was a different time back then, you know, the way, uh, things were, you know, just his, his, his father and son dynamic, uh, between him and his father and, you know, seeing that and seeing, uh, you know, uh, I don't say the strictness, but just the lot more, uh, I don't even know how to put the words, but you, you could tell that there was like, he was trying to prove himself to his father, um, and trying to, you know, really break out. And, and I think that helped force him to get where he was, you know? Um, you fast forward the story from his his parents fleeing Poland from Nazi Germany. You know it was funny, and we'll stop right here. But is uh, when he talks about how like his dad was smart enough to read the paper every day and stay up with current affairs to realize this was going to go down in his own country. You know, and I, I think that's relatable to today with our own capital markets, um, whether it's real estate or you invest in the stock market or wherever it is. If you don't understand what's going on in the rest of the world, you know, like. Had you been paying attention to coronavirus in China and that shutdown and the potential to happen here, there's a good chance you might have shorted the market or you might have slowed down your buying criteria. Um, I thought that was a really interesting point. 
Yeah, well, the good part about this book in general is it's so related to real estate deals in general. You know, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett's model, and I, I read a lot of the stuff on Warren Buffett. I'm sure a lot of you guys who are listening or watching do as well. But a lot of the Warren Buffett stuff is related to him purchasing businesses, you know, fractions of businesses through stocks or actual full businesses. In this particular case, it's all about real estate and mostly multifamily uh, in, in general. So it's just so relatable bec because of that. And he goes through the structure of a lot of the deals, how he, you know, how he found them how he partnered with people, how he raised capital for them. Um, it, it's, it's really, really, it's really, really interesting. So I like, I'm into that stuff because, you know, I'm a deal guy, but also an investor at the same time. So I, I see both sides of it. I love it. Yeah. And it was crazy when he started to talk about, <clears throat> I guess when he was at university of Michigan, that's kind of when he, when he lit his fire um, and really started to want to do, to do deals. And, you know, here's a guy that's a billionaire. And he's telling a story of us having the same exact struggles that we have today. Capital constraints, finding deals, trying to get deals across the finish line. Um, you know, he was talking about when he was trying to develop these apartments for student housing up by the University of Michigan, um, whether he couldn't get capital from, you know, his dad was his first go to, you know, friends and family, uh, trying to get capital out of his own father or to the point that the lady wouldn't sell the house because her, her brother wanted to walk to the bars every day. Um, it's, it's the same stuff that we go through on a daily basis, you know? Yeah, it was individual negotiation and one-off people skills that, you know, made him kind of who he is. So if anyone's read this book, I'd encourage you to comment uh, any thoughts that you have. Just comment below your thoughts that you have on the book, maybe some takeaways that you had. You know, the best part about reading is we all have different takeaways. I get something different out of this book than potentially Ian does and vice versa. And that's the beauty of... Um, you know, it's the beauty of it. So I'm curious to see what other people, uh, you know, ha have takeaways. So there's a few key things that I took from him. And Ian, you're 100 percent right related to how his struggles are this today are the same struggles that we all have getting deals to the finish line. You know, time is of the essence. You know, he has a story about an attorney who didn't, you know, wasn't trying to sabotage the deal, but he wasn't on the same timetable that these guys were. And he was like, listen, man, I have to get his deal to the table tomorrow. If we have to stay up all night, we'll do it. And, you know, there's stories of him spending 48 hours straight and sleeping under a table at a settlement in order to negotiate. Now, obviously, these deals are a lot bigger than the majority of the deals that we all do. But at the same time, it's very, very relevant because they have the, you know, they have this, you know, you, you have to find a deal. You got to partner with somebody potentially. You got to raise capital for the deal. You have to make it a win win situation. And, you know, based on so much of, of the things he talks about, you could see that he was in it for the long play. He wasn't trying to like squeeze, you know, one extra dollar um, out of somebody just to screw them out of a deal um, because it's interesting. Most of his deals are were done by the same parties. From the, He would buy deals from the same sellers who potentially were, were unloading, you know, he had stories about unloading and purchasing properties from the same buyers every 10 or 15 years because some of these guys were straight deal junkies and they bought, 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 bought. And then as recessions would come through, he, they would look back and be like, you know what? I'm going to get rid of some of these deals because I'm not equipped or capitalized for them anymore. So he would go and buy those deals. So he had the same sellers, he had the same buyers, he had the same partners, he had the same bankers, he had the same private capital investors. It's so relevant to everything that we all do in real estate investment, in, in investing locally. We, we all share the same principles. And we're all in it for the long term, and you got to be in for the in for the long term. You know, listen, real estate investing in general is a low barrier to entry. Anyone can go and do a deal, wholesale a deal, buy a flip, whatever. But the longevity of it and turn it into a real business is is the hard stuff. So, you, you know, one quick thing related to partnerships because partnerships were huge, and he was very loyal to a lot of his partners. One of the crazy things that he said that you know I would probably not recommend, but I understand the point of it. With so many of these partnerships, he never had partnerships agreements. You know, with with Jay Pritzer, with a lot of his, with uh, his, you know, his other, his other, uh, I forget his name, his partner that you know bought into the company, and um, and then and then they own fifty fifty. You know, throughout, they didn't even have partnership. They didn't have like partnership agreements. Hold on, let me scroll uh, this back up here so everyone can see what we're talking about. Okay, um, and it was like we didn't need partnerships. Like it was a handshake, and I agree with that. And 
I think in general, the principle of like not needing a partnership, because if you believe your partner is going to screw you or you believe that you're going to screw them or something happens, like you have to have those principles in place because you're not going to have the right partner. Everyone's had a bad partner in a deal. It might not be their business partner, but they've had a bad partnership or a bad deal go bad for one reason or the other. So like his whole principles of like, it's got to be on a hand. You know, he didn't really want it to be on a handshake. It's just kind of like they started doing business. They started doing deals together. And then next thing you know, they wake up three years from now and they got a hundred million dollars of their real estate. And they don't even have anything, you know, and you know, they're taking distributions they're taking draws. Um, you know, they're, they're sharing capital accounts, but then they don't even have <laughs> anything signed on it. So uh, when I listened to that, I didn't disagree with the principle of like, you don't need one, but I, I think it's, it, it it shows a lot about the types of deals that they were doing with the right people and they cared a lot about each other. Well, um, but I still, I still think you should have some sort of signed yeah. document just in case. I think he was, you know, it's a, first off a different time, you know, he was for, you know, he was shadowing or forecasting the uh, utopia of the partnerships that he had. And I'm sure as he got more sophisticated, there was more operating agreements, but you know, the man, it's just, it's amazing to watch somebody to be able to go in, <clears throat> you know, I, I think talking about Jay Pritzker at one point, he talked about um, he was on the hook for $50 million on a call or a put or whatever it was when he started getting into uh, publicly traded companies. And he went to his boy, you know, from, uh, what are they, Marriott or Hilton, whatever one the Pritzkers found. Hyatt. Hyatt, Hyatt. I think. Oh, I missed both of them. Um, but either way, you know, he just goes and says, hey, Jay, I need 50 million bucks on a handshake. And he had the wire <laughs> the next day. Like, that's crazier when he was getting a haircut in the hotel uh, before that deal where he talked about where he was sleeping under the table. Um, he had, ten, you know, <laughs> think about it. Back in the day, they didn't wire money. You had cashier's checks. He got a hand delivery while he was getting his haircut inside the hotel for ten million dollars in um in cashier's checks, it's it just it was a different yeah. time. But, um, but but it's the same principles. It's the same thing as that. You go to the auction, right? You go to auction. You have a runner at the auction for you, right? And you and you need um you you do a hundred thousand dollars worth of deposits, and you don't know what they're going to be. So you get some in five thousand increments, ten thousand increments, twenty thousand dollar increments, etc. Right? It's the same thing. The, the craziest part about this is I related to it a lot, but on a much smaller scale, right? He's doing $100 million deals. I'm doing $100,000 deals. But at the same time, like it, I related to it. I related to it with the partnerships. I related to the way that he raises capital. I related to it as like, hey, you get stuck on a deal last minute and your bank uh, pulls out or something. And then you got to call a hard money lender or a private lender or a family member or a friend or a colleague or a partner and say, hey, listen, man. You know, the, these guys pulled out on this deal. I need additional resources. Can you help me? Yeah. Um, and y you know, like that's that's the game. Like that's that that's yeah. part of it. And yeah, I say I really related to the relation or <clears throat> to the partnership aspect of it. You know, of like just uh, him and his partner. You know, he's like I'm the visionary, and my partner was you know really the operator. And honestly, that you know when he started talking about that, I was like, oh my god, it's like exactly like me and Dan. And they talked about doing pranks around the office. I was like, well, that's me, Dan, and Ryan. You know, we might not do pranks, but we always go in and have a good time. You know, we're always trying to do something fun. You know, just talking about those things that, you know, it, <clears throat> again, it's just amazing to see a guy that's a billionaire and has the same core principles that what we have, you know, on, like you said, like a, a much smaller scale. What did you think about when he, when he was, uh, do you remember the part where he was talking about, you know, the way he was looking at real estate was really just a spread? The cap rate was the spread over the debt service. Um, you know, it was just interesting to see how he viewed it. And granted, that was probably forward thinking then. And a lot of people think like that now. They're like, okay, well, if I can get a 10% cap rate and I'm paying 5% in dead service, I'm making a 5%, you know, net yield. I just thought it was interesting how his mind was working. And you could really, when he was telling the stories about the deals that he was doing, the, you could almost feel like he was reliving it and retelling his thought process of how he arrived to that deal. Yeah, that's why I love books like this in general, because 80% of them are, you know, uh, kind of like real life information that's helpful. And then 20% is kind of like, hey, man, this is my legacy. This is my book. I'm going to tell you whatever the hell I want to put in there. And it was the same as like the book Shoe Dog, uh, the oh, Nike book and some other really, stuff. Yeah. And I love it. I'm like, I was like, why did he even put that in there? But I guess he wanted to. And he, he's like, I'm a successful mofo. Do what I say, and uh, right. and, and and I liked it. And the cool part was that I 
that I liked was when he started, he started in smaller end markets. No one was investing in any market that wasn't New York or Chicago or DC or San Fran or, or wh wherever it was. Like that's where all the big money was. And when he was raising capital, um, he started in the lower, in the smaller markets and they were getting, you know, 20% returns on some of these things and nobody could believe it. Um, and again, it's the same thing as it is now. Like, <laughs> you know, you get yourself into a more established area that has consistent, you know, has consistency, um, has established, and you have a good solid rate of return that might be in like the mid to high teens or, or mid or mid to high, you know, below 10, like five, six, seven, eight percent, which is a great return. Or you you do more active investing in other markets, a um, little bit more heavy lifting, and you can get higher rates of returns. And I thought of, and I was like, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, Typically, if you're a passive investor, you know, you're getting a good passive investment is anywhere between, let's say, four and 10%. And if you're an active investor, you shouldn't be obviously getting something less than, you know, 10%. That doesn't make sense. If an active investor, meaning you're the one that finds the deals, you're the ones that put all the pieces together. And to him, you know, he I probably to this day was like, it, it, he wasn't coming in as like, hey, um, I want to. I want to put this project together. Like he, he was actively putting all the pieces together, which was granting him and his investors high rates of return because they were, you know, structuring these things. And like, dude, thinking about some of the stuff that he structured with student housing and about negotiating with every single person on the block in order to secure some of those assets. Like it just relates to the hustle that all real estate investors need, you know, need to have. I mean, so many real estate investors they just want to go on MLS and try to cherry pick a few deals here and there. And then they complain that it doesn't it doesn't work and there's not enough room in the deal. There's always room in a deal, <laughs> you know. And never yeah. in, in every market, there's enough room in the deal. It just depends on how bad you want it and how much you're willing to hustle to find that opportunity. And the dude was a hustler, and I love it. And you know, I'll let you talk in a second, but <laughs> yeah, I just I'm just I keep getting triggered of like things. I know, but like when you talk when you talk about being a hustler, I mean, think about what it took and like him and Warren Buffett and all these old school guys, what it took to be a hustler back in the day. I, I think he brought it up in his book. He's like, yeah, you guys just go on Google, right? And like you jump on the internet, you find what you want. And he's like, I had to go to the magazines uh, or the newspapers, look up the ads, see what was for sale, see what the comps were. You know what I mean? It was the same thing Warren Buffett talked about. He talked about having like that huge phone book of stocks and what their index prices, uh, prices were. Um, yeah. You know, they didn't have... Yeah, they didn't have Zillow or MLS or uh, although they did have an MLS. Uh, Sam said uh, a, a local MLS, but it wasn't as built out. Yeah, we have the online resources that they didn't have back then, and everything was a meeting. Everything was like, "Hey, I want to come to your office. I want to meet you for lunch. I want to do this. I want to do that." And you know, and you, you know, we we've talked about this in the past that you take the new school to the old school, you take the online to the offline, and that's how deals are made. Right. Instead of doing stuff, the old, you know, the, the new school way of technology, which is great. Utilize that to your advantage. But then you you bring it back home to old school, you know, sitting in people's kitchens or meeting for, for lunch or coffee to negotiate deals like that's where it's at. That's how relationships are built. Well, Zach Bryan just talked about it the other day. He said, when was the last time you received a handwritten note? You know what I mean? So to employ some of those tactics. Um you know, and you fast forward through his career, and I would be interested to hear what your thought on this is because I know, I know my thought, and I, I think it's true. But you know, he, Sam talks about you know he's like yeah, you know, real estate rates were compressing, uh, Japanese money came overseas, which is still a, an issue today when you get uh, into the large capital markets. Um, he said talks about overseas money coming in and you know basically blowing up everything he was doing, and him and his partner were getting bored, which. I think a lot of us leading up to the coronavirus were saying, well, rates are, you know, real estate's hard. What else can I go do? Right. And then he says, they realize that if you're, we're, are we good real estate operators or are we good entrepreneurs? And then they, they yeah. bridge that gap and off they went starting to go buy and rehab business, which is the same principle. Um, I know me and you both listened to a podcast from Jay Scott, uh, one that he did where he interviewed a guy that all he does is rehab businesses. You know, I, w what's your thought? Do you think if you're a good real estate operator, you're, you know, you're ultimately a good entrepreneur and a good businessman and you could bridge that gap to go be uh, I, a business? I mean, guy? I think, I think if you're a good hustler operator, 
uh, you understand the principles of finance, you understand the principles of everything that absolutely you, you can do it. You, you can do whatever. I mean, I've already talked about you know, I, when I do hard money uh, private lender calls and I, I network with a lot of other hard money lenders throughout the country, you know, and they say, you know, so many of them are like, oh, yeah, I, I don't I only do loans for um, uh, experienced investors. I don't do any newbie deals. And I'm like, first off, some of the first time investors that I've worked with are the best. And the reason why is a lot of them come from, you know, corporate America. A lot of them own other businesses. A lot of them are still hustlers and deal hustlers and they have resources. And those are you know, if you're successful in one industry, in my in my mind, I believe you can be successful in another industry if you're passionate about it, obviously. And it's the same key principles. Every time we talk about marketing, raising capital, funnel, you know, building um, lead funnels and things like that, it's the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're doing it with real estate or if you're doing it with a pizza shop or if you're doing it with a hair salon or if you're doing it with uh, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter the company. You need all those things in place. So the good part about real estate investing in general is doing one deal, there's not a huge barrier to entry and it's not all that hard to begin with. Like if you wanted to, I, it doesn't, you know, depending on the situation, it might not even be all that capital. Um, you know, it might not even all that much capital that you can rent. Like if you were going to set up, uh, I don't know, we'll name a business. Like if you're going to set up a pizza um, shop. Okay, if you're going to set up a pizza shop, well, guess what? You're going to have to sign some sort of lease. You're going to have to learn a, a lot about the uh, you know the business. You're going to have to buy supplies. You're going to have to have employees because chances are it can't just be you yourself. So like, there's a lot more risk and potentially a lot more margin, uh, lower margins on those particular deals than real estate or other businesses in general. So like, I think in general that if you can be successful and you know the principles of the of the business, every everything. I'm not talking about like, oh, hey, I know how to find a good deal. Can you find a good deal? Do you know how to run construction? Can you put systems and process in place? Do you know how to raise capital? Do you know how to build relationships? Do you know how to create partnerships? Things like that. If you have all that, absolutely. And I, and he does. And that's why I believe he, he did that. I mean, if there was any big takeaway of some things that um, you know, I should potentially do is as opportunistic as I believe I am, because I do believe I'm super opportunistic on everything. I want to be more opportunistic. And you know, I live in a, in a, uh, not a bubble. That's the wrong word, but like, you know, loans fit my criteria. They don't, they're very simple. And I move on, you know, when we acquire rental properties or we've done flips, like it either kind of works or it doesn't work. Uh, you know, are they in our market or at the, these price points Are these, the qualifications type of thing. And, you know, I think as you grow and expand, you do need to be more opportunistic to find additional deals. And, you know, he, he was able to, do so, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was it, it was good. I recommend anyone checking checking that out. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, if you're a fan of Warren Buffett, who most people sh are or should be, um, I do believe that Warren Buffett's one person that you really got to follow, especially because you know you understand a lot of key principles that he he does. But the best part about this book, it was kind of like the same thing, but related to real estate investing. That was the beauty of yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, no, it was interesting how he talks about like, uh, you know, like you said, tertiary markets, how he talked about doing like alternative asset classes. I think at one point they are or were the largest um, uh, mobile home park owner, you know, and that or manufactured home uh, park owner, which which was interesting. Now, related between him and Warren Buffett, because Warren Buffett seems to be the one that's always out in the front. Um you know, what was weird is, you know, Warren Buffett talks about, he's like, it was a slow, gradual rise. And I don't know if he's being humble and it was faster than what he says it was, but it just seems like with Sam, maybe the way he tells his story is it was like, it was like that overnight. I mean, he was yeah. 25, stroking $25 million deals back in the day. You know, we're talking about that. Sort of. So well, I mean, sort of, sort of. I mean, there's a, there's a few things. Um, I mean, he was doing, he was doing big deals, but also like, he even talks about like they had no operating capital. They had such right. a small team, even though he was like, we're, at, we're asset rich with cash poor. Um, and I think a lot of real estate investors are in that at the beginning because they're leveraged to the hill where they have yeah. high leverage or they don't have much disposable income that comes in, but they have a lot of that. So like he did so many deals in the seventies and that's what catapulted him into later in life. But like he was reliant on appreciation. So it was the same thing as like more, you know, Warren Buffett was in a similar situation. You look at car, if you look at Warren Buffett's net worth um, chart, it was like this, and then he got into his fifties, and then it was like that yeah. because you know 
you know, he was doubling his money every few years, things like that. So I, I agree. He didn't describe that. Sam didn't describe that um, too much, but like, I think that's where it was because in essence, you know, think about it like this, you buy a property for a hundred thousand dollars and you sell it for $200,000. Let's just say a year later, hypothetically. And then you buy a new property for $200,000 or, or whatever, $160,000. And you get that $40,000 in cash or whatever. So then you have some operating capital. He just kept leveraging and building and building and building and building and building. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think he was able to live kind of a good, a good life, but like, it was kind of like a Warren Buffett life. It wasn't like he was a super rich dude. He had a lot of assets. He had a lot of businesses and there's to be something to be said about it. Like he didn't need to, like, what was he going to do if he cashed out and had a million bucks? you know, in cash, what, what's that accomplish? What, right. what would that accomplish for him? So he just kept lever, you know, he just kept building and building and building and building it. Yeah. And, uh, I definitely enjoyed the story. I, I personally like, and you know, my favorite podcast besides this one and brother, her buffs fresh pot. But, uh, other than those two podcasts, how I built this, you know, because it's founders stories and it's interesting how you can relate every business back to your own. But like what you said at the earlier part of this is like, what I took away from this, what I took away from this versus what you took away potentially are two different things. I personally took away that, you know, having the right partner, number one works, which I checked off in my box. Number two is that, you know, he, he grinded it out. And then, you know, I guess I did take that away that he did grind it out and, you know, having asset rich and cash poor, it's a relatable thing that we all go through. And number three is just to enjoy life, man. You know, like those are the three main points that I took away with. Um, and it was just interesting to see how he, he created that and related it back to his own business. Um, and how I took away and implemented it and just, even if there's a few things, you know, of like at some point of saying, you know, maybe our portfolio, instead of selling it, we do a merger with somebody or, you know, our portfolio at some point, you know, consistently grows and grows and grows, you know, can you get to the capital market? You know, and it, it was inspiring to see a guy that started out the same way that we did. Granted, times were different back in the day, um, but the same size and did the same thing, went door knocking, you know, went and wholesaled houses, you know, trying to get that all that land together and aggregate it to develop it and then go in to ring the stock market bell one day. Like, that's pretty cool. You know, uh, do I have those aspirations anymore? Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it seems fun, but it comes with a whole nother level of responsibility. And he did talk about um, the stress and the drama that he went through and, you know, losing a wife over, you know, he said, I think I chose my business over my first wife, you know, and you could tell there was some pain there. Um, and it was just, it's interesting what you take away from those things. And it kind of puts you back into a reality check. Yeah, Chase, good good comment, 100% right. So the first time I actually heard about um, Sam Zell was on Tim Ferriss' podcast. And it's interesting because Tim Ferriss isn't actually the one who interviews him. Um, it's actually somebody else who interviews him on the podcast. But either way, it was great. And it was like, that's a two-hour podcast. Uh, that was the first, that was, that was one of the first times I heard of Sam Zell. And then I Googled and stalked him and <laughs> did whatever because I was like, this is perfect. And just if you have not read the book yet, that podcast is a very, very, very good overview. Um, you know, it's like 60, 70% you'll get from that podcast, but I still recommend reading the book because he goes in a lot more details on everything. So good point. Um, good point on that. And you know what I just realized? Did we even tell the audience, everybody, why his book's even called Am I Being Too Subtle? Uh, <laughs> I, was gonna, I was going to, I was going to start and I forgot about that because you hear that and it's like, yeah, that's not all that interesting. Um, and he, and he starts it, uh, the first paragraph of the entire first book of uh, the first book uh, is about, am I being too subtle? And that's it. And then he goes on. So what he means by that in general is he's a very direct person and he, and he likes to explain things and communicate and he takes pride in being a good communicator, which is one of the reasons he can do a lot of good deals. So the reason he wrote, uh, wrote uh, uh, what's it called? I titled the book, am I being too subtle? Is he wants to make sure that like, this is exactly how it is. I want to make sure this deal is a win-win situation. I want to make sure we're communicating correctly. If we're not communicating, like I want to make this crystal, crystal, crystal clear of what I'm trying to explain to you. And he prides on being able to communicate well with people to make sure this is exactly how it is. You might like it, you might not like it, but this is exactly how it is. Let's make sure we're on the same page so there's no misunderstandings in the future. This is how it is. Um, uh -huh. so, so I loved it. I agreed because... <clears throat> You know, one of the things that we work with, you know, internally with some of 
you know, some of our staff, um, as well as clients and things like that is like, I want to make sure when you communicate with somebody that you don't have to do three calls or three meetings that can be accomplished on one time. You know, when right. we have new loan officers that potentially work with us, it's not like, all right, cool. Well, let me do this. Let me do this. It's like, ask every question, spend the time up front on a, on a transaction. If you're working with a tenant, a seller, anybody in business, <clears throat> get all your questions answered ahead of time. Be prepared. Get on the phone, get in a meeting and talk and go through everything. You don't want to have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It drives me freaking crazy. Get on the phone. Now's the best time to do it. And let's go through everything. Even if it's a 20 minute conversation, let's get, get everything done out of the way right now and communicate it. So you don't have to go back and forth people. No one wants to get badgered back and forth about a scenario. Like let's, let's go through it all right now and get it all out of the way. So we know it. So all right, man, Ian, uh, <clears throat> This was good. I think we both had a lot of passion for it. We'll continue these uh, book reviews uh, as we continue to to read more books or listen to podcasts or things like that. I think sharing stuff with with everybody is important. And I think there's no better way to learn than to follow someone who's got a lot more experience than we all do. And, you know, it is somewhat and it also feels good, you know, when he talks about things that we're currently doing inside our businesses, because it makes you feel good. It's like, oh, wow, I'm on the right track. And then the stuff that he's doing that you might not be doing, you look back and say, okay, you know, these are things that I can change. Yeah, you just sparked another topic. We're going to go deep on it. But, you know, business is hard. Sometimes you feel like you're lonely out there. And to hear, like you said, like to hear somebody that's going through the same struggles, it's, you know, tenfold, if not hundredfold, more successful than you are. To have that affirmation that, you know, he went down the same path or he had the same struggles, you know, doesn't matter what industry is, whether it's capital, it's people. It's operators, it's bullshit lawyers. Um, you know, that, again, that story about him with the lawyer, uh, the one where they weren't on his side, and then yeah. the other one where he was like, yo, dude, you're just burning my fees up. And then the lawyer screwed yeah. up the documents. I, I've had that same PTSD, you know. like Yeah, and, and, yeah, into, yeah into his favor, and then he messed with them yeah. um, because he, he, he held them as hostage until he apologized and wrote a letter to him. So. All right, so All right. hey, who do we got? To, who do we got tomorrow, real quick, and then we'll call it quits. Tomorrow we got Martin. Um, he will be on at twelve thirty. He's in the note industry. He buys defaulted mortgages from um, banks and works with homeowners to get them reestablished and get their payments on track. We're gonna learn about how he does that business and why he chose that over real estate. And then um, second fold to that, he he went out and did the Dream 100 the right way. And he went out and found Grant Cardone and he will be interviewing him here shortly. So I'd love to hear that story, how he got connected uh, and how a guy just like us is able to interview Grant Cardone. So that'll be super exciting. Hi guys, what time, what time is that tomorrow? 1230 tomorrow. I see Sean Little's on here. Sean, you got, dude, you got to jump on here. Let's set it up. Let's have you on. We're always interested in uh, interviewing realtors. Uh, love to hear what you guys have to say about the market. All right, everybody. Until next time, take care. Thanks again. Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow at 1230. Yeah. Don't be late. Thanks for tuning in to the Real Estate Reserve Podcast. Do us a favor and like, comment, and share our broadcast. It helps the algorithm and helps us spread the word too. Till next time, thank you for tuning in.